<clears throat> it's time for us to begin. It's good to see everybody here tonight. We are here at the end of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be finishing up this most excellent book tonight. To clear up a little bit of confusion, we decided to push the quarter back a few weeks ago to end tonight. And so this is, we're finishing up a quarter. The new quarter will start Monday, so uh, Sunday, Sunday. The Lord's Day, Sunday. We are going to have new classes starting Sunday, and then of course new Wednesday night classes. Uh, There will be a marriage class next quarter on Wednesday night. Um, Particularly, I want to encourage uh, people around my age, anybody's welcome, but we really want our MASH and young group people to attend um, that class for sure. And so uh, I look forward to next quarter with uh, new classes starting. So... Let's get into this chapter, Hebrews chapter 13. He's going to close out this wonderful homily, this, uh, this letter um, to the Christians there. And he's going to close with some more exhortations and some encouraging warnings. Um, and he's going to really uh, kind of fire them off in rapid order. Uh, and so we're going to go through some things real quickly. Um, but there's a lot of good information in here. Chapter 13, in my opinion, sounds and feels more like an epistle a letter that was written, whereas all the other material that we've gone through has felt and sounded like a sermon. And so chapter 13 sounds most like an epistle, and I think you'll see that as we go through here. So, let's start reading in chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, if you remember back to the end of chapter 12, we close that chapter with the idea of uh, being grateful and offering acceptable, the word says worship, but it can be translated service, to God. So he goes on into chapter 13 and begins to tell us how we serve God. How do we serve God? By serving each other. He starts off, let brotherly love continue. It's important to see that he says continue. They had already been doing this. You go back to chapter 10, it talked about how they were taking care of people in prison and things like that. And so they had done a good job, but he wanted them to continue that. This is a sibling type of love that he's talking about. In ancient times, that was one of the most highest forms of love that there was, was this love between siblings. Now, I have to be honest, and this is going to sound weird at first, but just bear with me, I probably did not appreciate this type of love until I became involved with Morgan and her sister. Um the more I've been around them, I have learned that I probably have not been the best sibling uh, growing up to my sisters. Uh, But the type of love that Morgan and her sister have is the type of love that's being talked about here. What do they do? Every single day, they talk to each other. They want to know what's going on in each other's lives. They want to know if they can help each other. You know what else they do? They don't let little things come between them. They don't let little arguments stay between them. I've not, it, I was blown away the first time I saw them argue. Not because of how they argued, but because five minutes later it was like they didn't argue. They didn't let it come between them. And so that is the type of love that's being talked about here. Have concern for each other. Take care of each other. Be involved in each other's lives. Don't let little things that don't matter come between you. We're trying to help each other get to heaven. That's what's being discussed here. Then he goes on to say, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. In the original language, these ideas are connected very closely. To the original audience, it would have sounded something like this. Verse 1, Love of a brother, let it continue. Verse 2, Love of a stranger, do not forget to do it. And so really, he's, he's, he's telling us to love each other and to also love strangers. 
And so we do that but to strangers by being what? Hospitable. And what an important thing that is. Um, he uses, I think, uh, a little bit, maybe indirectly, uh, an example. He goes, and thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That is interesting to me. Um, I called Mr. Gary this morning and I said, okay, I got, a, I got a question for you and I need you to tell me the honest truth. I said, can you and me entertain angels today? He says, well, I don't know. I said, well, that's not the answer I was looking for. I think the reference here and probably to every Jew that would have been reading this would go back to Abraham. If you go back to Genesis chapter 18... Uh, three men appear to him under the oaks of Mamer, um, and he does everything that he can to be hospitable to them. He runs back to where Sarah is, and he tells her, hey, you need to gather all this quickly. When you read through Genesis 18, quickly is said several times. You need to gather all this. I want you to make some bread. And what does he do? He goes to the field, and he finds a calf who is ready to be... Uh, um, sacrificed and served, which would have been a delicacy in that time. And so he does all these things to be a hospitable host uh, to these visitors that he has. Now, I do think it's important for us to know, while I will be the first to say I agree with Mr. Gary, I do not know whether me and you can entertain angels today. I do not know that. I will say, I think it's important to, for us to realize it is not the, perp the point of this verse for us to be hospitable with the hope of entertaining angels. I think what's being said here, in short, is when you are hospitable, you never know what that's going to bring you. Neil Lightfoot in his little book on the book of Hebrews summed it up this way. The reference to angels does not mean that Christians should practice hospitality uh, with the express hope of entertaining angels. It is instead another way of saying that those who show hospitality to all often gain unexpected benefits from their guests. In other words, you never know what hospitality might bring. And so I think that's important for us to realize. We are hospitable to strangers. I would like to add that I think that is such a good way for us to help convert people when we are hospitable to strangers. And so I think that's important for us to remember. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison as, those, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Now, prison during that time was certainly not like our prisons now. Uh, they would not have had good treatment and good care uh, while they were in prison during, back in this time. And so any type of decent food or care that would have been given would have been from people that knew them that came to visit. And oftentimes, people would risk their own incarceration by going to visit people in prison. And so, uh, the challenge there is for them to remember those who are in prison as if they were in prison as well. The principle behind this is uh, demonstrated in a couple of different verses. You have Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What does he say? When one suffers... As a part of the body, guess who else suffers? Everyone else. The Lord Himself in Matthew chapter 7, you go back to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. If I'm in prison, get, who do I want to come and see me and remember me while I'm in prison? All of you. And so that's the idea that's being talked about here. Now, let's talk about verse 4 just for a couple of minutes. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Stop right there. Let marriage be held in honor among all. How far the world has gotten away from that, haven't they? Not only is divorce just, I mean, not a big deal to the world. Uh, you know, I marry somebody and, you know, we can... Try that out for a few months. If we don't like it, guess what? We'll just get divorced. Well, that nowhere matches what Scripture teaches, does it? Uh, now, of course, you have the idea of marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman being pushed heavily, don't we? That's not honoring God's marriage law, is it? 
And so it's important to realize that, that the world is mixed up on the front of marriage. And I would be the first to tell you that I think most of, if at least most of the world's problems can be solved by fixing the family. I'm a firm believer of that. Uh, and part of that is honoring God's rule for marriage. However, I do want to pause just for a moment and I want to encourage all of us. While it's easy for us to stand here and talk about the way, the, thing, the way things are in the world, and that's true, and it's important for us to know that, and it's important for us to teach our kids that, however, are me and you honoring our marriage by following God's rules for marriage? And I'm not talking about the specific example that he goes on to here in just a minute about being sexually immoral and adulterous. I'm talking about husbands. Are you loving your wives as Christ loved the church? If you're not, you're not honoring your marriage. Wives, are you submitting to your husband? If not, you're not honoring your marriage. It's that simple. And so, I think the challenge for us in in the church sometimes is we look outside so often and we see what's wrong in the world. Sometimes maybe we need to look within. And we need to make sure, hey, am I also honoring my marriage? Am I fulfilling my role as a husband? Trust me, I'm talking to myself as much as anybody else. Do I love her as Christ loved the church? If not, I'm not honoring my marriage. And so, he goes on and he gives a specific example, uh, and he says, God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Um, How much plainer can you get? Um, And how troubling it is that that is such a problem, again, not only in the world, but also in the Lord's church. It is a problem. Um... I just want to say to those of us who have parents, I mean who have kids that are parents, um, we have a job ahead of us of doing all that we can to make sure our kids honor what God wants them to be. And I think a part of that is not letting them be exposed to the way the world is. And some of that is involved with not having a smartphone, or access to the internet, all these different things. The access is so easy to things that Christians don't need to be involved with. And so I just want to challenge all of us who have influence over young children uh, to be diligent with that. And I want to challenge all of us to make sure that we are following God's design for marriage, including are we staying pure? Are we doing what we can to honor our spouse. He goes on and he says in verse 5, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Verse 7, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of, the, of their way of life and imitate their faith. So he goes on and he uh, tells them in verse 5, to, he warns them against the idea of being greedy, loving money. Interestingly, this is not the only time in Scripture that sexual immorality and greed are tied closely together. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul does that as well. He links covetousness and sexual impurity very closely. Why is that? Well, both of those are extreme forms of selfishness, aren't they? And ultimately, almost especially with the love of money, it comes down to a lack of faith and trust in God. It's a lack of trust that He will do what these verses say. And He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If that is in the forefront of our mind, guess what? We're going to be content. We're not going to be worried about having so much here that we have. We're going to depend on God. Why? Because He is going to be there. The material things of this world are fleeting, aren't they? 
Read through the book of Ecclesiastes and tell me what Solomon came to the conclusion of. All of it was vanity. Guess what that means? Useless. Meaningless. Has no value. No lasting value. And so, the point is, don't focus on loving and gaining so much in this world. What do we focus on? We focus on having God and Him being there with us. That reference, that, that verse there, I will never leave you nor forsake you, uh, is a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and also Joshua chapter 1. Those are a couple of different references. In Joshua chapter 1, you have Joshua being commissioned to lead Israel across the Jordan into the land of Canaan, finally. And God tells him several different times, be strong and courageous, and he also says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How do we get through this world? Content with whatever we have. How do we get... We know that God is there with us. That's why he goes on to say there in verse 6, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can happen to us if we don't have all that we have in this world? I think about my life. And I ask myself this a lot. What would happen if I just lost everything? Like if it was like Job. What would be my response to that? Well, I hope that I have these ideas minted right here that it's okay because God is there with me and he is my helper. And so he warns them not to have the love of money. And then in verse 7, he says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So there will be two more references to their leaders in this chapter. And I think there are two different groups of leaders that he is talking to. This is the first group that he is talking about. This group of leaders were ones that, that had taught them the Word of God at the beginning. And it seems to me that these are ones who are no longer with them in this world. They have passed away. That's why he says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So not only do you go back to chapter 11 and you look at the beginning of chapter 12 and these wonderful Christians have these cloud of witnesses there to look to and help be examples of how to be faithful to God and imitate, they also have the leaders that taught them the Word of God to look at their life. And don't you and I have the very same thing? What a blessing it is to have known Dale Ledbetter, Mr. and Miss Holcomb, the list could go with Miss Gladys Tomlinson. How many of you remember Miss Gladys Tomlinson? What a blessing it is to have had people in my life like that. And all of you know, know more people than that. The list could go on and on. But that's what he's... T Remember these type of people. Look to their life. It's so valuable, I think, to um, have the Scripture to look to where I can read about Abraham and I know the things that he went through and I can understand... Uh, the challenges that were ahead of him, and I can see that God was there with him, and he came out on the other side, and God was still there. But isn't there something different about having somebody who you talked to? You saw them cry. You saw them hurt. You saw them come through things in your life. And you can look back and you can remember them. And what a blessing that is. And so he tells them to remember your leaders, and imitate their way of life. Then he says in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, I dedicated one full slide to this verse because I think it is of extreme importance for a couple of reasons. First off, I just want to say, on a cursory quick read of this chapter, when you read through the whole chapter, start to finish, and you get, and you read verses 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, at first, 
chapter, verse 8 seems almost just out of place. Read with me verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse or strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, so forth and so on. So he's, he's firing off these warnings and these exhortations. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, when you dig into this, I think it teaches us a very, very valuable lesson and one that we've seen already in this book, and so it almost reinforces the idea. Remember the leaders who did what? Spoke to you the Word of God. And then what does he say in verse 8? Jesus Christ is the same forever. In other words, the same Jesus that was taught to you at the beginning is the same Jesus that is sitting on the throne right now. And if He is the same, guess what else is the same? His message. Do not turn away from Jesus. He is there. He's on the throne. He is ruling right now. Nothing has or will ever change that. That goes back all the way to chapter 1 at the beginning and the beginning of chapter 2 of Hebrews. Remember back to chapter 1, and he talks about all these different ways that Jesus is better than the angels, right? And then you get to chapter 2, and what does he say? Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. The message is the same. Do not neglect the words that were spoken to them. A couple other things I want us to appreciate about this verse. This verse teaches the timelessness of Jesus. Um, We all know that. Um, Other verses support that. You look at Isaiah chapter 41. It says, I the Lord uh, am the first and the last. I am He. Jesus Christ Himself while He was on earth in John chapter 8 uh, in verse 58 says, before Abraham was, I am. What is he saying? Well, really, that goes back to Exodus chapter 3, doesn't it? When God was introducing Himself to Moses in the burning bush, Moses says, who am I supposed to say sent me? And what does the Lord say? I am sent you. And what is that saying? Basically, it means what? I exist by my own power, and it, and it talks... It, 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 Uh, means uh, the timelessness that God has always existed. And so this is what's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God, as we've talked about numerous times throughout this book. There's one more thing I want to mention about this verse that I think is very encouraging before I move past it. In verse 7, it seems to me, like I've said, their leaders that taught them the gospel are no longer with them but Jesus is still there. Yes, we're going to have people in our life come and go, aren't we? We're going to have people pass away. Things are going to change, but what's the one thing that will never change? Jesus is there. He is our high priest, and He is always there ready to intercede on our behalf. While their leaders may not be there anymore, Jesus is. What an important thing for us to to remember. So in verse 9, he says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have been, uh, (coughs) excuse me, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. So again, in verse 9, that just (coughs) reinforces what we talked about. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. During this time, of course, that would have been teachings that uh, go back to the old law and things like that. But I'm here to tell you now, anything, write it in bold, underline it, and highlight it, anything that is contrary to God's Word is diverse and strange teachings. Anything. If you hear something and it's not found in God's Word or it's not based off of a principle found in God's Word, It's strange and diverse teachings. 
anything. My kids need to know that. Just now, tonight, they were asking me on the way to church about all these different church buildings that we were passing and asking me about them. Well, what do they do? Why don't they come here? What do they believe? And while a lot of that is way over their heads right now, guess what I tell them? It seems that there are some people that don't really follow everything that we read about in God's Word. But me and you, we're going to do all that we can to follow what we find in God's Word. Because anything outside of that is diverse and strange teachings. So... He gives a specific example, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. And so this is interesting. I guess uh, there were some Christians during this time that were struggling with food laws and food regulations and maybe trying to enforce those on the other people in this time. I'm not sure. That would not be the first time that that has happened. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians. Um, And so this would not be foreign to the New Testament, But that seems to me that that is some of the strange and diverse teaching that is happening uh, that he is addressing here. But he tells them that it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. When you turn to the book of Titus, you look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness. What is the grace that's being talked about here? Well, the grace that I know about that trains us, what trains us? What is good for our heart? The Word of God. And so, we need to make sure that our hearts are being strengthened by the Word of God, not by anything else. Nothing else will do it. Then in verse 10, he says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. One of the early criticisms of Christianity was that it didn't have any of the, uh, I guess, flair that uh, Old Testament religion had, that Judaism had. Um, It didn't have the temple, it didn't have all these rituals and and wonderful different things that uh, was in in many ways appealing to Judaism. Christianity did not have it. And so the author is kind of rebuttaling that. He's saying, we do have an altar. My question is, what's the altar that's being referenced here in verse 10? We have an altar that those who serve the tent have no right to eat. So under the Levitical system, under those procedures, the priests had the right to share or to partake of the sacrificial offerings. To eat of the altar then was to eat of the sacrifice. So what is our sacrifice? What is our altar? It's the sacrifice of Jesus. And so he's going to elaborate in verses 11 through 16, how do we participate in that? How do we partake of that? Verse 11, For the bodies of those animals who the blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. That is a reference to the Day of Atonement. They would take the animals and they would sacrifice it and burn their bodies outside of the camp and then bring their blood in to the altar. Verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate, or if you will, outside the camp. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside of the walls of Jerusalem. Outside of the camp. You go on, uh, in order to sanctify the people through His own blood. Therefore, let us go to Him outside the camp and bear the reproach that, uh, bear the reproach He endured. There's that word endured again. And so what is the first way that he talks about how we can participate or share in the sacrifice of Jesus? We go outside of the camp. When these first century Christians heard that, they automatically knew 
I have to cut myself off completely from Judaism. That's what he's talking about here. When you read throughout the Old Testament, you talk about being pe having people that are taken outside the camp, they are cut off completely from Israel. And so that's what he's talking about here. They had to separate themselves completely from that way of life. And then what? They had to bear the reproach that he endured. We cannot be a part of the sacrifice or share in that sacrifice of Jesus without suffering as he did. Now we're not going to literally suffer like he did, right? At least, most hopefully not. But we can't get through this life as a Christian and avoid suffering. We can't. The Bible tells us that we can't. That's important for us. Now, how are you and I going to be outside of the camp? We're not in danger, as I've said a couple of times, of going back to Judaism, are we? So what do we separate ourselves from? What do we cut ourselves off from completely? The world. Completely. There's no straddling it, is there? I was talking a couple of times today about how important it is for us to teach our kids. I was talking about it to patients a couple of times. I was just now talking about it to Hannah's dad. And one of the things that bothers me so much in the world is, is the emphasis that is played on secu placed on secular things. Specifically, sports. That was brought up a couple of times. And this is just a very minor example. <clears throat> As Christians, we cannot ever put that ahead of God. If we do it one time, kids are going to remember it. So, what do we do? We cut ourselves off completely. I'm not saying you can't participate in sports. But when there's a choice between being at Bible class and worship and going to play in a game that has no effect on your eternal salvation, what do we do? We go outside the camp. And we come to Bible class and we learn about God and we worship Him. So, we have to go outside the camp and bear the reproach that He endured. Verse 14 for here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is, a, is to come. Verse 15, Through Him, let, <coughs> then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit, uh, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. This is just another way of saying that we confess. A couple of times throughout this book, if you remember, there's been a couple of, of, of exhortations that say what? Hold fast your confession. And now, what does he say? You have to continually praise God and confess His name. I've heard Mr. Gary say this a couple of times. Uh, it's not really a confession, but it's a what? Profession. It's a way of life, isn't it? In other words, it doesn't just happen once whenever I decide to obey the gospel. No. It is continual, and that's what he says here. So, number two way that we participate in the altar or the sacrifice of Jesus as we continually offer praise and confession to Him. Verse 16 then, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And so the other way, another way that we do that is we do good to others. Uh, we've seen a little bit of this already in the beginning of the chapter when He told them to remember those in prison and remember those who are struggling. Right? He, he talks about that in verse 4. Now he says this is another way that we can participate in the altar or the sacrifice of Jesus. And, it, and I want us to be impressed with the wording, do not neglect. This is not an option. It's an imperative. We must do good to those around us. And we must share the things that we have. It is not an option. So, he goes on in verse 17, and he comes back to the leaders of the congregation. Verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. 
Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So, as you remember just a moment ago, I said, excuse me, I think there's a couple of different groups of leaders that he's talking about. Ones that have already passed away, but now these are their current leaders. Remember your leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Again, that is not a choice. Obey, and it's reinforced by submit. Now, of course, I think it is understood that that is within the context of Scripture. Right? If anybody tells us to do anything contrary to God's Word, we don't have to obey that. God is above everybody, right? So we owe everything to God first. Fortunately, we do not have to worry about that here, do we? And so, we obey and submit. But why? He goes on to give us a couple of reasons. Number one, for they are keeping watch over your souls. That word there for watch over can be translated, that can talk about, uh, it carries the idea of being sleepless, to lie awake at night with care. And that's the responsibility that our shepherds have. And I can tell you, at least ones that I know well, that is what happens. They lose sleep. Why? Because of the concern that they have for the sheep. And so, it bodes for us to help them. We don't need to make their job any more difficult. And so, we obey and submit because that is the great responsibility that they have. They are keeping watch over our, over our souls as those who will have to give an account. They're going to answer to the chief shepherd one day for how they took care of the Lord's sheep. Sometimes I tremble at the thought of that. I cannot imagine standing there on judgment day, not only do I have to answer for my own soul, but I have to answer for how I led everyone else. But that is the responsibility that these shepherds, these leaders have. And so, we need to obey and submit. We don't need to complain about things that don't matter. All that does is make it more difficult on them. Why would we do that? Their job is already great enough. Why would we complain about things that have no meaning? No matter. We don't need to do that. We need to obey and submit. And then he says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. It's no advantage to us when we have leaders who are not joyful and doing that in a proper way. I have this quote for you uh, that I wrote down, and I think it summed it up well. It says, this is a sober reminder that the welfare of the church is tied to the quality of the response uh, to the current leaders. In other words, if all we do is sit back and complain and grumble and go up to them after every sermon is over, man, you need to tell that preacher he needs to quicken that up just a little bit. In, in what form or fashion does that help our leaders serve with joy? If it doesn't help them serve with joy, guess what? That's no advantage to me and you. They're not going to want to keep doing it. And guess what? The church needs good men to stand up and be leaders of the church. And so, we have a responsibility to do all that we can to help our leaders do that with joy and not grumbling. Then he says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you uh, the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. So he asked for their prayers. Um, interestingly, it seems to me that at one point he may have been a part of that congregation. He says, I want to be restored to you. Uh, the sooner. Then he says in verse 20, now, the may, now may the God of peace, who brought you again from the dead 
uh, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So he asked for their prayers, and then in verse 20 he goes on to pray for them. And he describes God as the God of peace. There is no other peace to be found except from God. We know that from multiple verses throughout uh, Scripture. But I find it interesting that this is, in verse 20, the only reference, direct reference, to the resurrection of Jesus in all of the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now interestingly, that word that he talks about, raising Jesus, is translated brought. That's not the usual word that's used in Scripture to talk about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. But it is a reminder of one of the greatest truths that we have learned in the book of Hebrews. Real quickly, look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For it was fitting that He, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus, God brought Jesus up out of the grave, and because of that, He is going to be able to bring us to glory. And what a wonderful thought that is. So he goes on, the final few verses, verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. That is, that's contradictory in my head. And At one minute he calls it a word of exhortation, and at the end of the sentence he calls it, uh, I've written to you. So was it a sermon? Was it written? Was it both? I don't know. Verse 23, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy, send your greetings. Grace be with all of you. And so he closes in a very customary way, and I think in a very appropriate way. Uh, this is a, uh, an appropriate conclusion for a work that has promised the availability of grace from our heavenly high priest. And so it closes this wonderful book. I thank you so much for your attention. I hope this has been beneficial to everyone. Um, and I hope this has encouraged you to study even more this wonderful book of Hebrews. Now, new classes start Sunday uh, and then new classes Wednesday night.